Well, welcome everyone. I'm Lana. I did my master's here in Latin American studies. Uh, back to the presentation, it was my pleasure to connect my friend filmmaker Victor from London and my friend PhD student in education Alex behind me. <laughs> which resulted after the efforts and dedication of many, many more in this event here today. This event about fake news and education invites you to engage and discuss urgent contemporary subjects that are a concern not only to Brazilian society, but to all democratic societies. This panel here today will discuss the role of education in times of fake news, and we have amazing guests who are not only studying the phenomenon happening in Brazil, but also fighting against it in different forms. Our hope is to bring the debate further and draw parallels to the UK and the rest of the world. We would like to thank the Faculty of Education for having this space here today, and also the Center of Latin American Studies and CRASH, Center for Research in the Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, and COOPS, the Cambridge University Brazilian Society, for generously sponsoring this event. Now I pass the word to Alex, who will talk a little bit about the work of Pyrex and COOPS. Hello everyone. Um, it was my pleasure to connect you. Uh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Alexandre Lazio. I'm a PhD student at the Faculty of Education uh, here in Cambridge. And I'm a member of CLAREC, the Cambridge Latin America Research Education Collective, and also a member of the Cambridge University Brazilian Society, who uh, welcomes you today in, for this event. Um, CLAREC is a collective formed by academic students from the Faculty of Education at the University of Cambridge, and it aims to constitute a space for Latin America perspectives that bring together researchers working in Latin America context and those interested in learning more about them. Our key objective, and it's very related to what we are doing today, is to make the regional knowledge production visible, share current debates linked to education uh, research towards uh, the diversification and decolonization of academia. Based on, on these principles, and in order to democratize the privileged spaces we occupy in this institution, we intend to build a collective and a collaborative environment to promote a unity of perspectives formed inside and outside the university. We advocate that universities should be open and committed to traditional perspectives and knowledge that are not developing within uh, its own spaces and voices. We believe that only by value uh, and integrating others' knowledge, we will be able to transform the university into a genuine environment from which arise relevant contributions to society, especially concern social sectors uh, whose knowledge, histories, voices have been marginalized or even erased. So, Cooks is another uh, organization that is, is uh, organized this, this event, is a society organized by Brazilian students at the University of Cambridge that aims to bring the, uh, and promote Brazilian culture, identity, perspective at the University of Cambridge and the city of Cambridge, as well as to promote initiatives related to Brazil that contribute to democratize spaces uh, uh, is members assess in, the, in, the, in this institution. Also, Cooks welcome Brazilian newcomers to Cambridge by providing a space for students to flourish academically, socially, politically, and culturally. On behalf of Clareg and Cooks, there are some colleagues here from both uh, groups, we thank you a lot uh, for being here with us in person or virtually. So I, now we are going to start, and we are very grateful for Haider to be here. To start this event, I'm going to give floor to Haider Gandhi, uh, who will be the uh, moderator of this event today. Thank you very much, Haider. Haider is an assistant professor at the Faculty of Education in the University of Cambridge. Uh, her teaching and research interests are science education, the colonial 
Virtual and Pedagogy, uh, Science and Technology Studies, and Teachers Work and Professional Development. She was originally a science teacher in secondary and technical schools in Sao Paulo, state in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and before I officially start uh, my part of this, I just wanted to thank Alex and Anna especially for the amazing work you did in putting this event together. It's a pleasure to support your work in the faculty as much as I can uh, and it's a pleasure to be working to support the work of institutions like CLARIC and, and COOPS. Um, as a Latin American in this university, as a Latin American living and working abroad, uh, I can only um, it's very difficult to express the importance of those kinds of institutions for us uh, doing this kind of work that we do abroad. So we are very thankful for all the work you did, not just for this event, because I know uh, the amazing work that everyone uh, at CLADEC and COOPS um, do in, in relation to empowering Latin American Brazilian studies and, and work and initiatives across the faculty and the university. So thank you very much to all the members who are here, some members at the back, so thank you very much for, for putting this together. Uh, and thanks for inviting me to moderate this uh, this table um, on behalf of the Faculty of Education, which is kind of it feels a lot. Um, so, like Alex said, I am uh, originally a science teacher. That that's me, my heart. I feel like I am a science teacher in my heart. I worked in Brazil for many years as a teacher, and then I, I found myself um, working at this university. Found myself coming to this country to talk about education as a Latin American in the UK context. So events like this like Alex said, are very important for us coming from the Global South, coming from places like Brazil and other places in the Global South to share our experiences of education with others. So uh, thanks everyone for coming and to listen uh, to the conversations we're gonna have today. And as a teacher in, in my heart, I'm actually I'm extremely um, happy to be having this conversation about fake news and specifically the role of education in that. Uh, as we are gonna discuss tonight and we're gonna hear from our um, amazing group of speakers and my uh, not so amazing moderation towards the end um, that there are, there's an important play, place for education in this discussion there's a complex place for the education in many different ways education has been not just um, uh, being used as the hope for fighting against fake news for instance but it was is also something that suffers from fake news we have scholars uh, participating in the table today that are that are educators and are not doing education in Brazil anymore. And there's there are several reasons for that, and one of the main reasons is the topic we are discussing today. So I just wanted to flag that as an opening to the day. Uh, apart from moderating the conversation and keeping time, which is good for a teacher, right? You like to keep everyone on track. Um, I was actually also. Um, put here to give you a very brief overview of the agenda for tonight. So unfortunately, our head of faculty, Professor Susan Robertson, uh, cannot be with us today. She had a personal uh, problem, uh, but she sent her apologies and she welcomes everyone uh, to the faculty. Hopefully she can come uh, and talk to us in a different moment about uh, what discussing fake news and what discussing fake news in relation to education, to in relation to fascism, in relation to the rise of populism across the world, what that means internationally. So although we are talking about the case of Brazil here, I know that Susan and a lot of us here in the faculty are very interested in understanding the international global side of those discussions. So it would be great to hear from you here as well about that. So she sent her apologies and, and, and thanks everyone for being here uh, and to to work with us on this topic. I also want to thank uh, our amazing uh, group of speakers tonight. Uh, Marcia Tiburi, who's going to be the first person to talk in a couple of minutes. Thank you very much for coming. I'm going to introduce her in a second. Uh, we also have Jean Willis, who is going to join us from uh, Zoom, because now this is live. Hybrid events is a thing now. So Jean, thank you so much for, for being with us. Even from afar, it's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, and then, of course, for some of you might know him already from earlier today, we have the amazing Victor Fraga as well, sharing um, his, uh, his work around the coup and fake news in Brazil. So thank you very much to everyone. It's a pleasure to receive you in the faculty. 
Now, without further ado, I think we are ready to start with our first speaker. Uh, I, I, again, I am extremely happy to receive Marcia Tiburi here tonight. Uh, Marcia is a philosopher, plastic artist and writer. She's currently living under exile in Paris and works as a professor at the University of Paris 8. She has written extensively about the rise of fascism and fake news in Brazil. She authored the book the Psychocultural Underpinnings of Everyday Fascism, published in 2021. So some of you possibly saw her uh, talking about the book uh, on that table over there. And she's always happy uh, to talk even more about her book because it's an amazing uh, publication. So thank you very much, Marcia, for coming. And the floor is yours. Thank you. <laughs> I want to thank everyone, Alexandre, Anna, Haira, Cambridge University, and especially Victor Fraga, uh, Jean, Chu. Uh, I will try to speak in English, but if it's too difficult for you, will I will switch to Portuguese to change it to Portuguese. But I will try to speak in English. I will try to speak slowly to, to, to make it easier, this, this conference. <gasps> then, uh, we have a common subject that is to reflect on fake news in the context of education. I think you all know education after Auschwitz published by Theodor Adorno uh, six, 60 years ago, around, around 60 years ago. I would like to begin to, by talking about this text because the need Adorno says that all educate, educational efforts should be made to overcome Auschwitz. Having said that, we can consider that all our efforts should be made to stop fake news. Why do I say that? Because fake news is a generic name for lies. I am a philosophy professor and I have spent my life trying to understand how mentality, mentalities and uh, sensibilities are constructed. We are beings that uh, inhabit uh, lives in language. And that means we inhabit three complex territories. The realm of truth, the realm of lies, and the realm of fiction. These territories are <coughs> in dialogue with each other and all have cognitive, epistemological, aesthetic, ethical, and the political viability. And for this very reason, they can function as weapons, as forms of power. Certainly, certainly, lies are used as a weapon, that is, as a metho methodology and a political technology against which we need to oppose truth and fiction. This information and the fake news that feed, that feed it are a fundamental part of the construction of a propitious terrain for the implantation of the brainwashing process, processes uh, essential for fascism. Fascists, as well as all authoritarianism, destroy people's subjectivity in order to better dominate their minds and the bodies and, in this way, their lives as a whole. To understand the issue of fake news, we need to understand something about the establishment of fascism that happens through fake news, its mere campaigns, and the whole context of disinformation that advances in the world today. This means that we all need to understand power games and that education needs to talk about power to explain how teachers, 
uh, students and society as a whole are being vi victimized by power games. I really believe that school, the school curricula, for example, needs to be dedicated to an education aimed at understanding power games in our time. This implies understanding the media, religious discourses, and the historical and the political process uh, that affect people's private and collective lives. Uh, the moral and political task of education cannot be erased. In the sense, it is important that young people and children, as well as people of all generations, are informed about the ways in which what is true and what is lie are constructed and manipulated. It's evident that the story of uh, the history of uh, fascism is the history of lies and fake news. It's not possible to form a lucid people if we don't show them the power games, which are language games in the context where they live. I am in favor of a very interdisciplinary education in which we study story, philosophy, uh, geopolitics, art, ma mathematics, languages, all of these at the same time and keeping in mind that children and young people are beings open to the world and that they are capable of uh, making relations between all these subjects. The urgency of the work of uh, discernment is renewed in these moments in which the strategies of uh, psycho power take over minds and the whole, uh, the whole scenario uh, of subjectivity, subjectivity uh, in which language is produced is under siege. I have further developed the, the thesis of language under siege and of fascism as a language game, as well as the thesis of the consumerism of language in the book just uh, uh, published by Bloomsbury. Uh, Bloomsbury. Uh, I would like to talk a little more about the concept of psychopower because I believe that education as the formation of the human being must be attentive to it. We are under a cultural war and within this war there is a real operational work. Uh, it's an, it is an operational work that is to say uh, exp an experience that works like uh, in a laboratory. What I understand as a laboratory? The laboratory is the place chosen to implement the experiment. In this case, Brazil was uh, chosen for this experiment, but several other countries have been joining the same process. Part of the experiment in the laboratory is concrete. It implies dismantling the institution, institutions and the system of rights guaranteed in a democracy. And um, in the, the 19, 19, around the, uh, around the 19th, um, Moniz Bandeira said, said that Latin America was a laboratory of neoliberal experiments. After him, many, many began to speak, many people speak, uh, began to speak from this image of the economic political laboratory involving Chile and Brazil and uh, much later, many other countries. Now, neoliberal capitalism has a logic of a village, village, village of uh, economies, of economies uh, that laboratory condition implies building parameters to solve that certain neoliberal practice. Uh, basically, we can say there are uh, uh, 
there is a floundering of the local economies, including uh, knowledge that is seen by the system as capital and not, not as something that belongs to humanity, for example. Uh, then uh, this, the question of the knowledge is a question very important uh, to neoliberalism and is very important to the question of um, uh, this system of uh, uh, disinformation and fake news and uh, uh, the question of fascism. Then uh, there, there is this question very concrete, but another part of the problem implies just subjectivity. It is absolutely important to guarantee that people believe the lies as if they were, if these lies uh, were true. For this, it is necessary to put an end uh, to, to stop, uh, to questioning. That is, uh, it is necessary to remove critical thinking from circulation, because this thinking does not allow the lies to advance. That is why I return to Adorno, Adorno to say critical thinking is the great enemy of fascism and education is absolutely uh, related to this. In analytical terms, what I define as psychopower is the calculation that power makes about what people think, feel and desire about the subjective space that leads them to act, uh, leads people to act according to the needs of the system. I refer to the capitalist system organized on disinformation that seeks to replace critical thinking in the old parad paradigm of truth. In very simple terms, this means how the government and the articulated powers of capitalism organizes brainwashing in an accountable manner. It is a kind of mental emptying produced by the mechanisms of concept, uh, conceptual leeching, we can say. In very concrete terms, uh, what I have called psychopower are experiments made with language with a um, view to a specific ends uh, in order to winning elections and uh, reaching political power. Then I think education uh, is uh, necessarily is uh, could be uh, or, or should be uh, f uh, a kind of fight uh, against this uh, political power uh, that uh, uh, touch and insist over the, over the knowledge, you know, over the subjectivity. To finish, um, I think I can tell you a little bit about this book that is now being published by Bloomsbury. The book, uh, uh, this book is a kind of a summary of, uh, of the main thesis of this, the, the four books that uh, I published in Brazil. Um, but is a, this a summary of this, this other wor uh, works, but uh, not only that, uh, in this book, I, I am also concerned with find, finding a way out uh, of this situation, this situation that is the fascistization of our society. And I insist on placing an ethical demand on our theoretical and practical actions. Either we build a culture of dialogue or fascism will be the new destiny of the world. The book, this psycho culture 
cultural underpinnings of everyday fascism. Uh, has a subtitle, Dialogue as Resistance. Uh, and this book brings several reflections trying to show the links between the ethical or subjective aesthetic and the political levels of this, this thing. Um, the book uh, speaks of the social, <coughs> about the social and the subjective basis that produces fascism. Uh, but also of how fascism is a political technology of neoliberalism. What explains the phenomenon of Bolsonaro, himself a kind of, uh, uh, we can say, scare, uh, scarecrow on the plantation in a country chosen to be an eternal colony uh, of uh, imperialism and the colonizing, colonizing states at the service of uh, of capital, like all of Latin America. Bolsonaro has only one function in this government, to be the puppet that calls people's attention every day and is the main operator of the manipulation of the masses. Paul Guedes, for example, the corrupt economy minister, is the real boss of the operation of destruction of our country, Brazil. My my work has been to show uh, to show how the operation of fascistization works, as it is an operation in language. Uh, in my book, published in uh, two thousand fifteen, called <coughs> "How to Talk to a Fascist." I talked about the signs of fascism in the Brazilian culture uh, around, for example, 2013. In that book, whose, uh, whose the thesis are resumed in this book in English, I said that the hate had been invented in the form of a language game. I have been working on the relationship between language and politics, uh, and it seems more and more evident to me that what has been called by many political thinkers and analyzed analysts in general, the hate speech is a specific language game that can be implemented through <coughs> the mass media in societies just to manipulate the masses. In this book, I want to show how fascists also advances with characteristics that make it even more popular and strong for uh, the hypnotized mass masses. <laughs> One of these elements is the performance of machismo, uh, which has become a real political capital in Brazil. Uh, in Brazil, screaming hysterically against political minorities, manifesting uh, with a grotesque, spe a grotesque uh, speeches, has become a common performance used by many, pe many political men and all the people who seek fame in the era of politics reduced to spectacle. Uh, Bolsonaro campaigned political, politically with the, he, he, he made her campaign politically with a body sign, a body sign, uh, uh, you know, this sign, the sign of Bolsonarism, uh, uh, using his hands in the form of a gun. The apology for the death of uh, leftist people and the appeal to the rhetoric of communist invasion are part of the gain of the rhetoric uh, this, uh, around this uh, uh, general hatred. This general hatred is, uh, I think, uh, like a, a new capital, a capital, the, the, the hate speech 
uh, it's like a merchandise that we can I can buy and we can uh, put in circulation uh, as if we are uh, if we are a fascist. There is, uh, however, behind the rhetoric of hatred, what I call the rhetoric of, um, uh, we can say, uh, bewilderment, like uh, like uh, uh, like this. Uh, I think is a uh, kind of uh, uh, worse than this rhetoric of hatred. With the the project of psycho power is just to. Uh, produces um, incoherence and produces a uh, like a delirium all the time. Yeah, it's important to to uh, leave people to uh, don't uh, don't comprehend nothing. And then uh, I think this is a very interesting uh, part of this uh, end game. This this. is just uh, like a language game. It is all part of a strategy in which psychopower is the role, the role, the calculation that power makes about what people think and uh, feel, and the actions uh, what uh, people can do uh, is calculated by this psychopower. Psycho uh, don't uh, then. Uh, my book was written precisely to alert and help uh, dismantle this uh, this thing called psycho power, this system, uh, as critical and uh, reflective thought. Philosophy is the greatest the greatest shield against the barbarism of fascism, and we can say the same about education. That is why it is worthwhile to continue teaching and writing despite all the losses and all the horror. We must continue to fight for the freedom of vote and the expressions against its mystification and manipulation. Thank you very much. Very much, Marcia. Um, I forgot to say at the beginning that we're going to have a, a roundtable Q and A at the end. So I want to thank Marcia for her contribution. Uh, amazing ideas around psycho power and around um, the notion of critical thinking. That for for those of us who are teachers, um, is something that we keep talking about, we keep thinking about, and we keep going back to this discussion about. What does that mean and what we can do? So I'd love to hear some of your ideas. We have uh, Paulo Freire's statue outside this room, which brings us back perhaps to that kind of conversation. It would be great to, to keep discussing that, especially how to talk to a fascist. I think that would be a very interesting conversation for us to pick up as well uh, at the end. So thank you again, Marcia. Uh, it's my pleasure now to welcome our second speaker of the night. And that second speaker is actually joining us with, through the magic of technology all the way from Spain. Uh, so Jean Willis, thank you very much for joining us. I might ask some support from the tech people in the room. Uh, we putting Jean in, in the big screen. Um, we might need to get the transition going as well, right? So while we do the magical technological thing, I just want to introduce Jean to everyone here. Uh, Jean Willis is a scholar in political science at the University of Barcelona, where he researches the spread of fake news and the rise of authoritarian governments. As an award-winning journalist, he also writes about civil rights and liberties. Jean also serves two consecutive terms as a federal MP, what would be a federal MP here in the UK. So he served two consecutive terms as a federal MP in Brazil before going into exile in Spain. So it's a, a massive pleasure to receive Jean today. And thank you very much, Jean, for, for contributing to contribution our conversation. The floor is yours.
Thank you, thank you, Anna. Thank you, Alice, and the University of Cambridge and the Faculty of Education, especially. I would like to thank Vito Fraga, which uh, was one of the responsible people to bring us here. Thank you. To my friend, Marcia Chibur. It's always great to listen to Marcia. It's always difficult to speak after her for me. I'm sorry for my voice. My voice is a little hoarse because I've, um, just, I'm just coming out of a flu and I'm sorry not being there in person as expected. Unfortunately, I had a problem with the renewal of my immigration papers. I am in exile, as you know, and because there was a delay in relation to these documents, I was not able to be there with you face to face, most particularly because the UK is no longer part of the U European Union, which makes it even more difficult to go from the EU to the UK. However, I am very happy to be here with you to give you my contribution. I'm not from education, Although I'm a teacher and I have worked as a teacher for a good part of my life, I was a secondary school teacher, but much more as a, uh, as a teacher of tertiary education. And I'm a master's in language and linguistics as well. And, and I also, I'm also doing a PhD in political sciences in the area of disinformation. So the contributions come from my place, which I occupy, and of the knowledge I have and I bring from these areas. So the first thing, I wanted to think about the idea of fake news, which becomes popular from around 2016, not by chance, no, not by coincidence either, together with another term post truth. It seems like the University of Oxford included it as the word of the year, of the year post uh, truth. And fake news becomes more popular in 2016, and especially with the emergence of uh, Donald Trump, who becomes president of the USA. And from then on, which literally means fake news, <laughs> uh, becomes more popular and is used more and more in the newspapers, in the TV media, in jargon, in the academia, and even in daily usage. But today, we need to understand that fake news, as we speak, and as we, uh, uh, we use it as a political phenomenon, does not correspond some, only to so-called fake news. Fake news is uh, an economy of disinformation, of hatred for financial uh, profit. Fake news presupposes an economic system, an exchange, a symbolic exchange of disinformation towards, it's important to say, that is uh, programmed and geared towards in order to make political and financial gains. So part of the fake news, for example, of this economic system, the commodities exchanged and the meanings exchanged, fake news, conspiracy theories, insults, digital fraud, words or, or, or discourses taken out of context or put in different contexts, and also harassment through a spiral of silence. And I'm using here uh, Elizabeth Noy Gruber, 
uh, which is the theory of the spiral of silence. So this is what we would call together as fake news, in the sense that in the sense that we're debating here, which interests us not only as researchers and academics and intellectuals, but as political activists and also as people interested in defending democracy. How does this economic system uh, is conceived? It's conceived, it comes together when neoliberal capitalism expands to the internet, brings a new technology of communication, which is at the beginning of the 1990s, becomes more popular and commercial. So from then on, neoliberal capitalism uh, makes use of and appropriates this uh, technology not only for their own means for maximizing profit, but also colonizes the internet which had emerged with a potential, with an enormous uh, democratic potential. We used to say that in the 90s where I was a computer programmer, where I went to university for in, to learn communication, we believed that the internet was liberating because it would break the means and the model of mass communication. So you had a mass communication where you had one receptor that was broadcasting a message to a, to thousands of receptors who could not answer. And so you have this mass communication means which is emitting these messages to the mass and the mass is not acting through words but through silence, which jean used to call the shadow of the silent majority. So the masses, they would say if they like or didn't like a program, if uh, the audience would be reduced. So the internet then appears as a possibility, a new possibility for communication, changing this communication, making it a circular model where the, the emitter is also the receptor. So the internet, like earlier technologies, produces a, a great and enormous impact in the old technologies. So whenever the new technology arrives, it redefines previous technology when it doesn't absorb it. So, for example, the, the world went through the radio era. So when television comes, uh, television incorporates radio, bringing something which it has, the image, something new. Uh, really, uh, an image in movement was already in the cinema as an earlier technology, but the video play is incorporated in the technology and swallows up the radio. And the same thing happens with the internet. Internet produces a great and enormous impact throughout all the other mass technologies. And at the same time, it converges and all these medias and all these means come into the internet. And of course, these technologies don't change only our habits the way that we are in the world, the way we exist, but the impact are connective structures too. So when neoliberal capitalism appropriates itself of this new technology, which had this great democratic potential, it re-establishes our relationship with the space. I always use a metaphor, I've already talked about this before, of the ocean and the aquarium. So we had in front of us an ocean which had to become well known, to be navigated, and then the neoliberal capitalists arrived and made our relationship with the ocean a relationship within an aquarium. So it constructed these invisible walls which stops us uh, discovering this ocean. And these aquariums in the internet 
They are the social media, the apps and social medias. All social medias and their apps. So we were gradually losing interest in navigating the surfing, the internet of the, to become users, followers, all members of certain communities, our relationship becomes one with the apps which are already made for us and installed in our devices. These devices that we carry and we charge, which are a revolution in the sense that we bring our television in our pocket, something that we couldn't imagine in the 1990s. The idea of a worker would go to work taking his own television. Now we take our sound system and our TV and everything with us, which is constantly in this flow of communication. So this deappropriation, a neoliberal appropriation, as it it's also changing itself and transform itself, which Shoshana Huboff calls uh, vigilance capitalism. It doesn't just only appropriate. Uh, take over the space, but uses the hardware where the softwares work, which are our mobile phones, our tablets, our laptops, and transform them in uh, surveillance devices. To start with, it would be, uh, let's say, a commercial surveillance where they identify our behaviors and our patterns, words that can be take, uh, changed into publicity aimed at us. So that platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, etc., started to collect information about us, all sorts of information, in this interaction that we have with these, these tools. We are constantly providing them with this information, and this information this, uh, this platforms uh, this information is used to provide us with services and products which are made to our own image and which or are within demands that we didn't even know we had or at least didn't even imagine. And then you have this idea of having this uh, diffuse idea that you're being surveyed uh, surveyed by Facebook and then suddenly you went to see something and then the, the, this marketing appears and said, hang on a second, I thought about this and this is here. Because these platforms and devices and apps work through um, artificial inter uh, intelligence uh, which interprets and make a calculation, an algorithm, and so they know how we're going to act and how what we're going to want in the next minute. So this transformation from capitalism into a surveillance of neoliberal capitalism and the appropriation of this technology will lead and will demand us to become more and more under the control of these technologies. The more we use social media, the more this flow, we are bombarded and, and encouraged to consume. So these algorithms understood and this understanding took place through the, the, this idea of, of Occupy Wall Street in 2008 and then the Arab Spring, which happened through social media, especially through Twitter, 
This algorithm starts to understand that these interactions increase and the permanence of people in social media increases when when the low emotions, the lowest political emotions are exploited. So they understood that when this brought uh, fear or hatred, this publication brought more interaction. The more people interacted and left comments and spent more time in social media when they were they had they were scared or when they there was hatred. So this communication started to modify these algorithms to suggest to us a content that would produce or brings these sentiments from us, fear, anxiety, hatred. So we started to be really within our queries. The um, algorithm started to decide which content we should be consuming. And for more, we wanted to get out of this, these suggestion of the algorithm, this that they send to you, this that reaches you, is what will keep you longer for longer in the media and will bring emotions from you and not a rational idea. And that's why we have so much hatred in the, internet, in the social media. And some people spend so much time and write horrible things. And if this had only an individual impact or in the lives of individuals, it would already be terrible given the level of anxiety and depression. Anxiety and depression is, is the very important pandemic that's taking place, apart from thinking about suicide. If we only had this impact, it would already be disastrous. It would be enough for platforms which colonize the internet, change their algorithms. But this is not enough. The exploitation of these low political emotions started to impact on democracy itself and the electoral results and produces effects in, com in countries where they lived in relative harmony. And these emotions produced by hatred and the exploitation, the electoral exploitation of these instruments Results, we know, in massacres, genocide, shootings, and of course, in the rise of the worst of the human aspect of the human beings. So the idea of the far right starts to ride exactly at this moment. It comes back to rise in the world, to emerge in the world, because of these reasons I am explaining to you now. So there are different countries start to feel or see the return of a populism tinged by fascism. We're not to open fascism. We have as a model, as a main model, Putin in Russia, but then we also have in Western country, Donald Trump, which from this model of communication used his campaign in the propaganda and the marketing that he makes, he starts to generate clones in various parts of the world, building an international of the far right, which exploits these new technologies to produce polarization and allow capital neoliberal capital uh, takes over the wealth and the natural resources of certain countries very easily destroying uh, the welfare state 
and allow large corporations start to substitute the place of the state. So the state and the government is converted in these various countries. You saw the rise of the far right as an armed uh, arm to defend the welfare. And of course, this economy, the system of uh, uh, disinformation and hatred for political and or financial mean, uh, gains, this economy has a history. So it's important for us to understand that the historical phenomena can be explored in their genealogy, in a Foucault sense. So, I don't, we can bring the door not to understand neo-fascism or neo-Nazi fascism or the populist governments because they bring us this idea of a cycle of authoritarian systems of the 1930s that led to the World War. So, we need to look at this gene uh, genealogy, which is a little of what I do in my work, where I'm um, looking into the gene uh, genealogy, the use of lies in politics, and forces us to understand that we need to do not only this gene uh, genealogy, but also the archaeology of certain lies which are taken as truth from a long time ago. So one of the big lies which is taken as truth for a long time, which served to colonial, new colonial projects and invasion of countries, this, uh, the maintenance of dictatorships, is the phantasm, the ghost of communism, the fact that there is communism threatening the world and that this communism uh, it makes us to uh, to bring the armed forces of capitalism against this communism. This is a lie that led to the rise of fascism and Nazism, Frank, uh, Frankism, Salazarism in, in Portugal, Spain, Italy, Germany, in all these cycles of the 1930s. The ghost of communism was used the idea that the world is threatened by communism. And we see that this lie is repeated once more. It was, repeat, uh, was repeated in Brazil, um, Bolsonaro used in Brazil, Duterte used, Trump used it, Orban used it, Erdogan uses it, all these people, and Putin, who is president of Russia, who, where there really was a real communism during the Soviet Union, but Putin is not a real communism. And China, which proclaims itself communism, practices, practices one of the most uh, uncivilized types of capitalism. So it's important to look at the archaeologists to remove uh, uh, what's on top of these lies to understand what is the origin of this fear and this manipulation. And to conclude this first uh, part of my talk is that this phenomenon which has to do with the world, it will take place in each country in relation with its specificities. So before we talk about the specificities of Brazil, it's important to talk, considering we're here in the education faculty, that this new technology of information and communication, that is internet and is hardware, the apps and social media, they produced an enormous negative impact in educational systems in that Many students no, are no longer happy in the classroom or they question their teachers about 
knowledge which are which is consensual the idea of the world being round or, or spheric the shape of an egg and that is turning around itself and is going around the sun so this scientific consensus, the consensus started to be contested by students that were watching YouTubers and used to say that the world is flat. So they were contesting their teachers with a lie, with a conspiracy theory. So we can see how these technologies are already impacting negatively the educational systems. In the case of Brazil, where we have an enormous deficit in quality education, a colonized country which spent 350 years of slavery, of economy based on the slavery of black people and their descendants, a country where we had the birth of a republic as a military republic, a country formed by oligarchies that were formed during the colonial periods of a predatory and ignorant and racist elite, education has always been attacked. So that's why the figure of Paulo Freire, which is so celebrated here in the USA, is very attacked by this elite because the educational system and the desire of the dominant classes in Brazil, which has inherited, uh, has a legacy of all these years of colonialism and slavery, uh, shows us that education is a privilege and that poor people should resign themselves to learn at most how to sign their names and to read so that they don't become emancipated as citizens and accept slavery under another name. Because well, what we can see is a return in your neighbors <coughs> of slavery under a different name, the name of entrepreneurship, of free enterprise, of freedom or liberty. This is the mystification not to allow uh, uh, the fact that or to for us to see that neoliberalism is a similar to slavery people. So Brazil who had problems with education, with low quality of education, people leaving education early, where teachers are paid very badly and the payment of the salary of teachers could, doesn't allow that person to, to barely eat, let alone buy books, going to see culture, etc. Teachers in Brazil don't do this, and they don't do this because they, they don't want to, it's because they can't, because Brazil has always treated badly education. So a country with a huge deficit of education, when you had this culture, digital culture coming and swallowing up everything, it was obvious that the economy of disinformation and hatred, a program and directed a system for making games would be very successful. So Brazil became a lab for this experiment. And Myself, uh, just like the woman who spoke to you before me, we are victims of this economic, economic system in a way that it's difficult to imagine the type of violence that was perpetrated against us through lies, hatred by the far right, which in Brazil rose to power, having Bolsonaro as a scarecrow and its representation. We need to be aware from here onwards. The Faculty of Education need to incorporate into that discipline this topic, the idea of the digitalization of culture with its uh, material, ethic and moral implications and above all, because these are systems which form imaginaries and liberate systems and spirits, we need to prepare ourselves to deal with this order of the world that wants to enslave us 
uh, under the line that we are exercising liberty. Thank you very much. This working. Just checking that uh, the team on Zoom can hear me okay. Just to check if this is back. Just yeah, John, I think you're saying hi or yes. It means that you're you can hear me okay. That's great. So thank you very much, John, for for you, for your amazing presentation. It brought me so many follow-up questions um, that I'm gonna perhaps put to the table, but one thing that I feel uh, that is extremely important for us academics in social sciences, in humanities, in education specifically, but also um, in the hard sciences, if we want working in, in fields of natural sciences, technology, is to think about what, are, what is our role in this kind of uh, situation. What is the role of technologies? What is the role of us working with technologies, with science, with people, with societies, with culture, in, in these discussions that John put for us? And I can already say that I'm going to bring a question to the table in relation to what does it mean to be an academic in this scenario? No matter which area you work, no matter if you work uh, more closely to society or if you work more closely to a lab, that is self-contained, what does that mean for us? Working in knowledge production, in knowledge development, working in te knowledge teaching, to work in a scenario where, um, like Jean mentioned, we have a policing kind of system around uh, our professions of, of people who speak to other people and produce knowledge uh, for, for several different reasons. So I'm going to bring that back in a couple of minutes uh, when we come back to the table in the discussions. I just wanted to put that forward for you to keep thinking. And in the notion, in this idea of producing knowledge and, and producing information, I want to welcome our third speaker of the night, Vitor Faga, who is going to talk to us a little bit about the work he has been doing as a filmmaker around this topic and, and, and in this idea of communicating what is happening in Brazil, what is happening more globally, and, and engaging with the pitfalls uh, that might come from, from putting yourself out there and talking about this area, this work on fascism, this work around fake news, um, in a scenario of an actually authoritarian government. So thank you very much, Victor. Uh, so just to give you a sense of who Victor is, because he's a very prolific uh, filmmaker. So Victor, Victor is an Anglo-Brazilian Anglo journalist and filmmaker. He's the founder and director of the T-Movies, the portal for thought-provoking cinema. And he co-directed the documentary, The Coup the Top Factory, about the role of media manipulation and fake news in the collapse of Brazilian democracy and the rise of, of neo-fascism. So thank you very much again, Victor, for contributing to our uh, event tonight. And it's a pleasure to have you here. And the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Kyra. Well, I feel really, really humbled and uh, also a little bit daunted after talking after two huge titans. And I'm, I'm a journalist. The journalist knows very little. We investigate something over there, then we go somewhere else. But I do think we, we play a, a pivotal role all the same. I strongly believe cinema is not merely entertainment. Cinema is a very powerful hegemonic tool. Cinema is not a tranquilizer where you sit back and absorb it. And you may do as well, but you're being manipulated and manipulation mandates that the person that's being manipulated is not aware of the manipulation. So I believe in cinema that um, hits you like uh, a ton of bricks cinema that makes you think. I'm not a very prolific filmmaker, actually. This is my very first film. It, takes, it took me and Bombay sitting over there 
four years to make it. So we have fun very, very hard, and I do plan to make a, a lot of films. Uh, I've already finished my second one, but this is my, my first one. Uh, but what I wanted to say, this film is, uh, is an educational tool. It's not uh, a piece of entertainment. It's a film that should teach some lessons so that we don't perpetuate the errors of the past. Some of you were here earlier and they watched the film in its entirety. I'm going to show um, a short extract from the film, four to five minutes, and then I'm, I'm going to say uh, a couple of words about it. So, um, roll the tape. Thank you very much. Let's do the tech magic again. А я же могу быстро сделать, что если каудера на тажении, то просто при экстрема зрения, что мерзли и не тому контроль. А Глобу фу папа приспал, só que a Globo errou, ela exagerou na dose. Porque ela foi estimulando isso, foi estimulando isso, e essa, essa demonização da política, essa é, 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 satanização de tudo que é coisa pública, é perigoso, porque isso também se volta contra o jornalismo. E se volta contra determinadas coisas que a Globo faz, que a Globo, você pegar a cobertura jornalística, é uma cobertura totalmente partidarizada, politizada. A Globo é um partido político na cobertura jornalística. A mídia brasileira é o zero e dizer em medida. A mídia brasileira criou o clima, só para pegar mais recente, está no índio, na origem, mais recente. No golpe de 64, a mídia brasileira criou o medo do comunismo. Está lá o comunismo no Brasil. Não, 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 não tinha nada de comunismo. Não é progressista. A mídia brasileira estimulou as marchas com Deus, pela família, pela propriedade. É a mesma coisa que agora. Nas marchas com Deus pela família e pela propriedade, as placas eram tapa-cuba, né? é, é, em defesa da família. A mesmíssima coisa agora. Estimulou com mentiras. Envenenou a sociedade, contaminou a sociedade e contaminou esse setor mais egoísta da sociedade. noticiários antipetistas. Hoje, no Brasil, o antipetismo é como o antissemitismo. O ódio ao PT é tão imenso que, quando eu me filiei ao PT, as pessoas ficaram com medo, as pessoas minhas amigas, e as pessoas diziam, Márcia, você não deve fazer uma coisa dessas, você vai ser vítima de mais ódio, que sendo antifascista, sendo mulher, e agora petista, sofre muito ódio. Nós temos duas tradições extremamente é, é, golpísticas. Que, que a, a escravidão acha que a questão social tem se resolvida com violência e repressão. E a, e a ditadura acreditava que, que para o país se desenvolver e crescer, não tinha de ter democracia. Esse processo é um processo que eu diria mãe e pai de todos os golpes. This was the grisly reality of the military regime. In 1990, a secret mass grave from the early 70s was discovered in a Sao Paulo cemetery. It contained more than a thousand bodies. Among the remains of those so far identified are those of a young woman involved in the armed struggle against the military. Her parents had been searching for her body for 18 years. According to her father, she'd been violated with a truncheon and her breasts had been mutilated before she was killed. So, in 
you look at Brazil's democracy now, although a lot of people think that Brazilian democracy has always existed because anyone under the age of 35 doesn't remember the dictatorship, but really anyone under the age of 45, um, because they were too young to, to sort of live through its last stages, which is half the population or more, more than half the population. Um, it's basically the equivalent of what the U.S. would be in, say, 1820, in terms of the fragility of its democratic institutions. A gente está vivendo é, um salve se quem puder. A população pobre, os ativistas, ecologistas é, que lutam pela reforma agrária estão sendo mortos pelo Brasil afora. E Marielle foi morta aqui no Brasil e era uma mulher da política, uma ativista negra, feminista, que lutava pelos valores mais caros da democracia, uma grande pessoa que foi exterminada por um jogo. Sorry, Marcia, I'm not seeing you. I feel really, really awful. But, uh, but then I have, I have another reason to invite you to come on the 29th to show, to see the entire film. There will be a debate with Jean, with Marcia, victims of fake news in Brazil, and there will be victims of fake news in this country. So Jeremy Corbyn will be there, and Baroness Christine Belova, who is a member. Is it, she's in the House of Lords, she's an anti feminist campaigner in the House of Lords. And the BFI is a very prestigious, very conservative organization, so we had to fight a lot to get that screening in there. So, um, wh why did I want to show you these little extracts? I wanted to talk about a uh, few different things. First of all, uh, the fear of communistization, which has been creeping. Um, throughout the history of Brazil, in the 60s we had a coup to save us from communistization, and it's all back now. I mean, we had the Workers' Party in power for 13 years, and they're saying they're coming, they're coming, they're going to turn Brazil into a communist country. The Workers' Party is but a center-left party, has even embraced some very new, implemented some very neoliberal strategies which raised a lot of hairs. Um, and I think it's not very different in here. I'm going to read to you. Uh, this is from the uh, 17th of June 2020 in the UK. The government has ordered schools in England not to use resources from organizations which have expressed the desire to end capitalism. The Department for Education Guidance issued on Tuesday for school leaders and teachers involved in setting the relationship, sex and health curriculum, characterized anti-capitalism as an extreme political offense, <laughs> and it equated it with opposition to freedom of speech, anti-Semitism, and the endorsement of illegal activity. So, I think uh, the writing is on the wall. What we're seeing in Brazil is not exclusive. There are many parallels on both sides of the Atlantic. People say uh, there has been no dictatorship in Brazil. That woman clearly said that after we saw a video about um, the bones. Bolsonaro once joked about the bones. People were searching for the bones of people killed by the dictatorship. And he said, we're not dogs. We're, what, what are you doing seeking bones? So that's the level of perversion you get. And, and a lot of people think there was no uh, dictatorship. A lot of uh, people are too young to remember that there was a dictatorship. And a lot of people don't believe fascism would really destroy democracy yeah? more than often, more than once, many times. I've heard people say, oh, no, he's not going to do that. Bolsonaro is not that bad. So people really underestimate uh, the power of, of, of the fascist forces. Yes, and, and this is really through, um, through a, a perversion, a misunderstanding of, of education. First of all, the, the understanding that com uh, communist, communism or anything that's anti-capitalistic, that's critical of the establishment is toxic. We've seen the near criminalization of the Antifa movements which is a huge perversion. I mean, we want a war against fascists, but now anti-fascists are being criminalized. So uh, the point I want to make uh, as a journalist, and I'm 
Don't let that just stick for too long because I, I allow my film. It's not just my film, it's a film by Barney as well. We're sitting over there. Oops, no, he's vanished. Uh, <laughs> oh. oh, no. Oh, no. Both of us worked very hard on it. So uh, I really hope you can come on Sunday. And if you're in London, the film will eventually be available for for streaming. That's my, my little contribution as a journalist. As a Brazilian journalist living in the UK, reminding people in Brazil that the phenomenon is being observed from outside, but also telling people in the UK what's happening in Brazil could happen over here as well. So that's that's my duty, and um, uh, and I'm very glad you're here listening to me. So thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Victor. Um, you actually helped me open the door to something that I wanted to bring to the table, so that's going to be brilliant. Uh, and thanks everyone for listening. Uh, given the time, we are now coming back uh, to the table, and we are going to open the table for questions. Uh, so we are going to have some questions coming via Zoom, via the, the people joining us online, and we are, of course, open to questions uh, from, from people here. And before, um, so because I am the moderator, I get, the, I get this uh, amazing <laughs> experience of perhaps asking uh, my initial question just to get things started. So why do you think about the questions you want to ask? I'm just going to put a question that I want to ask. Uh, both John uh, uh, on Zoom, but also you, Marcia, and you, uh, Victor, in relation to your subjectivity, yourself in this. And, and Marcia and John, you talked a little bit about your exile uh, as a scholar, as an educator uh, from Brazil to abroad in the movie, in the documentary. And I just wanted to ask if you would, if you could comment a little bit about what it means to be a Brazilian abroad, talking about these topics that we are talking about as communicators, as educators, as scholars, knowing what is happening. So what do you think is ro the role of people like us? And what is the price to be paid for going against the grain? We talk about the anti-capitalist teaching here in the UK. Uh, we see people fighting against that. What 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 is your experience of doing that as an academic, and academics, and scholars, communicators, and as human beings? Um, so just to put that as a, as a starting point for us uh, to discuss, and who wants to go first is mm -hmm. the one going first. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I, it's very difficult to to explain to say. Uh, to talk about this question of uh, exile. It's very, very difficult. Uh, I love to speak about education and, and uh, uh, fake news, uh, and I, I think to speak about myself is very hard. But uh, I'm writing about that. Uh, I, all the time I write, uh, me and uh, Jean on a uh, uh, we are we uh, wrote uh, a book uh, about our experience as uh, exiled people, uh, and uh, I think writing is, is uh, easier to yeah. to elaborate this experience that is very very hard because uh, he and me me myself uh, I I. Uh, leave Brazil in uh, 2018, and uh, uh, after we have uh, uh, the pandemic moment, very hard to all the people. But uh, uh, after I lost my, my father, and I didn't see my family uh, uh, since uh, uh, this time, this year. That year of our of our tragedy, a Brazilian tragedy, with this uh, government uh, fascist that was uh, uh, chosen by by people, by population, uh, by a, a, a dem, uh, paradox of democracy. That is a question important to us understand, 
And uh, I, uh, I, I'd like to say one thing. I live one day, day by day. Today we are here. Yeah. And we have uh, you. <laughs> and we have uh, this, this moment, <coughs> this the event, and we have uh, Cambridge, and we have uh, one each other. <laughs> and it's very nice and uh, alive. And yeah. very important. Yeah. yeah. That's great. And I think, um, can I just, and just to compliment, don't worry about that, just to compliment, I think it's, it goes back to. You all mentioned to, to a certain extent the idea of Paulo Freire and how Paulo Freire is, is an important scholar to this conversation that we are having. And I think one thing that, that reminds me, and he lived through the same kind of experience himself, and his notion of pedagogy of hope, his notion of hope and solidarity is really, I think, something that, that we as scholars and as people working in this field need to, to embrace and I hope these spaces, spaces like the ones we are trying to create, really bring us together and I think there is something uh, that you put together about hatred uh, and about dialogue, which is something that comes, uh, Paul Freire was really, really uh, uh, putting forward in his work, like how can we come together in this scenario uh, mm -hmm. and, and how can we empower each other in this kind of because I think we need each other more than ever, right? And I, I think there is a, another thing very important that is uh, people that are not Brazilian. It's very difficult to us understand uh, the Syria situation, the Ukraine, the Russia situation, the African situation, if we don't understand the culture of, of a country, of any country. And then, uh, I, I think, I feel that it's very difficult to, to the other people in France, in Spain, in all the uh, Europe, uh, but um, sometimes, uh, now, I, now, I think uh, with the rise of fascism in the world, uh, it's possible to, to, to produce this uh, comprehension, uh, collective comprehension. Uh, and I, I hope that we can have more um, loose, loose uh, uh, wisdom, yeah. uh, wisdom and more uh, reflection and more dialogue in, uh, in uh, abroad uh, in, uh, between the countries, uh, and we need to to uh, put together our our uh, tragedy <laughs> uh, me, uh, uh, also um, here in England you have uh, a problem <laughs> a lot of problem the problem of um, monarchy sorry but the problem uh, <laughs> the, 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 Boris Johnson and the, the rise of uh, uh, right uh, the restream right and, and all the, all the, all the the countries in the world, and then I think we need to fight for a, a international a, a kind of a, a, how can I say that a, a, a cit, cit, uh, citizenship, citizenship, citizenship. Uh, uh, international <laughs> citizenship, a cosmopolitan inter, inter, uh, inter citizenship. Uh, because uh, we need to to fight together. That is very very important to uh, overcome this situation uh, here and in all the the, the the world. Thank you, thank you, Victor. Do you want to share a little bit of how do you how do you position yourself in this? Also, in terms of making the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, my situation is slightly different. Um, Differently to Jamatia uh, and to Jean, I moved to this country you know, donkey years ago, a uh, long time ago, and I, I, I came here by choice. And um, I love this country, I love this country pieces, uh, which doesn't mean I love the monarchy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm a Republican, I've been 
I consider myself British. I have British nationality. I think internet. Uh, I think nationality is a very inclusive concept. I think you can be British and Brazilian um, and Spanish all at once. Uh, Theresa May once very infamously said, "If you are a citizen of nowhere, you don't really belong anywhere." Well, I'm, I'm a proud citizen of nowhere. I um, uh, I love being being a citizen of nowhere, and I. And I find that very refreshing. Um, I eventually want to do um, a film about media buyers in Russia, and I want to draw parallels between Russia, uh, Brazil, and the UK. And um, so, the, the, yeah, the way I, the way I see it, my role as a journalist is to continue. Uh, I want to continue to investigate the topic of, of fake news and media buyers. I think I'm, a, I'm in a fairly comfortable position, not that everything is perfect in this country, but I don't think that they're going to come and shoot me in the head as, as they would in Brazil. So uh, despite all of the problems in this country, we do enjoy at least some freedom or some physical integrity in that sense. But there are other ways of destroying people. Uh, I mean, look at what the media did to Jeremy Corbyn. I mean, you may not like him, but I think very few people will disagree that there was an orchestrated media campaign to paint him as as a racist. And again, I'm not a huge fan of the man. I have a lot of reservations, but I'm not going to going to applaud when the media in the entire country are dying, t uh, attempting to to deconstruct him. So. <laughs> My role as a, as an individual, as a journalist, and as an internationalist is to uh, yes, is to demonstrate that these uh, that these phenomena are are very similar everywhere. And I, I do want to go to Russia. I do want to investigate things in Russia and, and, and a little more depth. Thank you. Yeah, we just need to speak close to the mic, so the Zoom. Uh, people can also bring us, uh, John. I don't know, John. If you want, if you want to come in and, and share uh, some, some of some of that as well, otherwise we can collect some questions from the public. É, já. Eu não sei se você. It's difficult to reflect about exam right now. Exile is a theme in itself, it needed its own conference. Mm -hmm. But my Tiburi and myself have dedicated ourselves to the stars from our experience, our individual experiences. We have reflected about the, this condition of exile, of being outside our, our land, but at the same time being present in the virtual space because of these technologies. And what does that mean in our lives, including in terms of our biological clock? How is it to act in two different time zones? I would say I am not Spanish. I don't have Spanish citizenship. I don't have American citizenship. So I am a migrant, an immigrant, an immigrant that is asking for a global citizenship more and more. And this is one of the tasks that we have for this millennium is to allow people in this world, who reside in this world, are treated as residents of this planet. Because if we think about the planet, we are all here. So a global citizenship, the universal, uh, universal basic income, are things we need to think seriously about. So I am from nowhere at the moment because I have two identities, which I think cannot be reduced, as Hannah Arendt said at the end of the day. They anchor, what anchors us is our mother tongue. And this mother tongue, the, the, this language I speak and I love, and, you know, in which I express myself, 
it was an imposed language. It was a language that was imposed in my country by another, by a colonizing country. So Portuguese is a legacy of the colonization of Portugal. So this mother tongue, which is the, the last place which where I belong, was given to us through colonization. So I would say that the condition in this world of, is not a, it's not a good place to be. And when you're in exile, the people who forced you uh, into exile think that you should remain a victim. They don't, um, don't accept that you leave the place of the victim. So these people who forced us to exile want us and want exile to be an expression of our suffering and death in, in, during our lifetime. And even when we reinvent ourselves in exile, when we are able to reinvent ourselves as people and recover our place uh, from where our voices, from where we speak, where we sh when we show our happiness, this is an affront, it's seen as an affront. So to show our happiness when we're in exile is an affront. And so they tell us that we are being a tourist in Europe without thinking about all the difficulties that we have, both in terms of existential difficulties and material and emotional difficulties, and they accuse us precisely because of this, so that we go back to that place, so that we can become and carry on being a victim and deny us the ability of surviving. I mentioned this a couple of days ago uh, in a program uh, which I take part in Brazil in, in terms of Lula's wedding. So why did Lula's wedding annoy so much the he hegemonic and uh, mainstream media? Because that meant a victory of Lula over the political power that wanted to annihilate him both politically and as a person. And Lula survived cancer, he survived prison, he comes back invigorated, stronger, becomes a catalyzing force of hope and love in Brazil, and he marries again. This is really a problem, this happiness of Lula. So at first, I was hostage uh, to the fact of the situation. And I said, that they, these people took everything from me. They took my political career. I was a, a, a successful rising politician. They took away my friends, my land. They took over every single space where I was living through permanent fears with bodyguards everywhere. And I was, as an honest man, I was incarcerated and then I'm going to allow these people to allow my life in Europe be a continuation of this I said no I'm not going to and what's important this affront means that I won't be scared of being happy we are here we produce this event while participating in this event unfortunately I couldn't come here because of immigration but I am here speaking to you live. I am alive. Victor is made a film. Me and Marcia did a film. We have another visual work. We have more work to do. And this is the answer we have to give to these people. Because um, happiness is a hot weapon. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. That is extremely inspiring. I can, I can, I can attest to you here in the, in the room at least that everyone is nodding to what you were saying, and I think it goes so nicely with what really comes for me, especially as someone who was educated to, through Paulo Freire, this notion of hope and love, and how to fight and how to emancipate ourselves in this global citizenship. We are. Going, we are doing that, we are going through that with love and hope. And I think 
that is an, an important message. Uh, Victor wanted to share an, an extra comment here, so I'm just going to pass that to him. <clears throat> yes, just very quickly, uh, an anecdote. A few days ago, I went to pick up my mother uh, at the airport in Israel. And as I was driving to the airport, the officer called me. I was driving. My mother doesn't speak any English. And uh, he asked, who are you? I said, I'm Maria Soko Hussan. Um, what are you doing here? I said, well, I, I live here. Are you, are you settled here? And I mean, I, I, mean, uh, I do sound vaguely British. I think someone can, anyone can tell that I've been here for a while. I'm obviously not British. So I turned around and I said, well, I'm British. I'm as British as the Queen. Um, <laughs> and, and he carried on with a very perfidious, not perfidious tone, but, very, but just um, inquisitive. So what do you do? I'm a journalist. Um, and finally, and fi finally he gave up. Uh, but, uh, uh, his tone was obviously very demeaning. He, he really wanted to make me feel as an alien who was harboring my even alien mother. So, and, and that happens all the time in immigration. So, I, so sorry, we're talking about immigration. I just ha had to share this little anecdote with yourselves. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. I think it's, it's important that we, we share those experiences as well in terms of, of the solidarity that Paulo Freire and others uh, discovered in this field before this notion of, of coming together and supporting each other. So thank you, thank you for sharing. Uh, we have a question from the public here. Uh, so I'm going to share the mic uh, so we can everyone hear a uh, question. Thank you. Hello. Hi. Hi. So this is, uh, before I make, I make my, my question, um, I would like to make a point. So, um, we've been talking about fake news and uh, we know that the, the, the owners of the platforms of fake news, they are huge and they, 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 they make money. And the people, people who lie to make wars also are like Tony Blair, they are afraid. But unfortunately, a person, a journalist who, who told the truth, who showed the, the world the truth, it's brought in a, in a British prison today, and I'd like to remind you that Julian Assange is about to be deported to the US, and I, as an activist, I'd like to ask everyone to sign petitions and, and do whatever you can do for Ju Julian Assange, because he is actually the opposite, uh, the opposite of fake news, so that's my point I'd like to make. So, and then I would like to make a question, because we, it's good that Victor mentioned about the movements and um, um, in the, we are, we know we are living in, a, in a fascism and we know that fascism is the, I would say, gorillas of the capitalism and, um, and what uh, I would like to ask the, 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 to, to the panel and my question is, is there any hope that we can, you know, we can do anything with this system, with uh, living in a, in a capitalist system, do we have any hope? Uh, as in this system, with making money machine, which destroyed our uh, love, destroyed our forests, destroyed our planet, destroyed <coughs> our friendships, destroyed everything. So, uh, is there any hope on that? So, sorry about that. <laughs> Speaking of capitalism, that's the one million dollar question. <laughs> so I don't want other one. Um, if uh, John, if you want to come come first, just for a change, or, or can we do that, John? If you if you want to come first, if that's all right. Yes, I can start. Okay, not a problem. There is something. There's a whole mythology of hope. Hope is the last of our human feelings that was in the Pandora box when we opened the Pandora box and it was closed immediately. Then we had hope that stayed there when all the, the bad things of the world left. Hope is, is something we wait for. 
and so, but that, that the word itself uh, in Portuguese to have hope is to wait. So I have waited less in my life. I was much more active. I was far more of an activist. I waited a long time. I waited for food that never came. I waited for toys or hope for toys that never came. And I waited for a long time or hope for things. And I just found out that unless we fight, things never come. So more than hope against neoliberal uh, capitalism, there's an action, there's political activism. We need to rescue the dignity of politics, and not only of representative politics, but other forms of uh, politics, like this one we're, we're doing today. We need to express solidarity, we need to be an activist, and that means that we will be a little bit annoying. People don't like activists because they have this annoyance, which is always reminding people that things are there. So we need to have activism that with problems that are common to us, especially people who have children, nephews, grandchildren. This is work, because this is empathy. What sort of world do I live, want to leave people in? What people do I want to live in the world? So if that worry is, I love my children, I want to leave a better world, so we need to engage with a better world. Your child will be much better in a world if he's gay, le a lesbian or trans and is able to express their own uh, sexual orientation without dying, then the world has to be a tolerant world, where if, the, if he is one of these things, he can live without dying, she can live without dying, because perhaps my child might not be the standard hetero person. So if I'm an immigrant or the son of an uh, immigrant and I live in another country and I may be a person of colour, then I have to combat racism, because the world I'm going to live for my children has to be a world that is not a racist world, where the police is unable to distinguish uh, my child from a delinquent because of the color of their skin. So if you want somebody to express their uh, uh, religion, you need to live in a world where you have religious tolerance, where the hegemonic uh, religion doesn't stop people uh, of being that other. So if you want to have water in the world, you have to fight against the privatization of water. So more than hope, we need to start working and fight. And why am I fighting? I, I never sit down and, and um, go and rest because I have always needed to act in my life to have that which was denied to me, but not to God. It wasn't a, it was denied to me by a few people who were appropriate of the wealth of the public good as a private good, and they think that they can treat me as nothing of of uh, where I have to live of of silence of the the remainders of what's left over to live in a cupboard, and that's why I've always been an activist, and in this world. That we're fighting against the far right, we need to be activists more than ever. And education has a very essential role, both the formal and informal systems. We need to be able to deal with communication, talk to people, however difficult this may be. We need to be able to open a window, a moment for this communication and trying to find a common point, a common place. So I dismantled the whole uh, discourse of a taxi who was against the Barcelona mayor, mayoress, Colau, but he's bombarded with information every day by, by the media who are always attacking her because she wants to make water public.
And then the private companies, all those companies who want to privatize, they fund um, campaigns against us. So the taxes that's listening, taxes that's listening to this every day, he has this idea that she was a bad man. And then he asked, he made, he asked me, first he told me what his opinion was, and I decided how I'm going to approach this without losing this person. And then when he asked me if, if I was Brazilian, he started talking about football, and I said, ah, let me say something. I don't like football. And he start, I started to explain to, me, to him why I didn't like football when... And the homophobia stopped me liking football. So he started to explain to me things about football. And from that dialogue, from this conversation, and the fact that I couldn't live football because of homophobia, I was able to find a way to talk about the city and how she was making the city more inclusive. And she was defending a very important right and a basic right, the right to have water. And at the end of the day, I dismantled the whole of the, his discourse. And he said, no, you spoke to me in this way that you spoke to me with this patience. And you're not somebody from here, he said. So it's a challenge. So there's people who are open. Some people are walls. Where we can't go over them. The walls are so high that we can't even reach to the other side. So we, we can't waste time with these people. So we need to know who we can talk to and who we can't. But if we see someone where there's a key, a hole, a window, let's use it. So we need to be activists and we can't hope. Uh, we can't uh, just wait and hope. Thank you, John. That was actually such a comprehensive uh, 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 take into this that um, I, I was informed here that it answered a lot of the questions we had on the Zoom uh, chat as well. So that, that's very brilliant. It actually reminded me when you mentioned this notion of being an activist and this, this social political education, which is something that is being dismantled in educational systems across the world. Victor mentioned the notion of, of preventing teachers here in the UK from engaging with anti-capitalist teaching. That was related to the Black Lives Matter movement. That was related, related to the Extinction Rebellion movement. That was put into place to prevent teachers and their students in their classrooms from engaging with that kind of social political learning and social political action. Section that, 28. Exactly, Section 28 as well. They were put in place to prevent people, teachers, students, their communities from developing that social political learning and that social social political learning that is necessary for acting. We see that, for those of you who are familiar with Brazil, we see that with the school without party uh, in Brazil and how that, that was used to prevent teachers from doing the same kind of work in their classrooms and also it was part of feeding into fake news around the, teacher, the work of teachers and, and persecuting teachers based on that. So I think that, that notion of the social political action, the so, social political literacy and learning is extremely important. So thank you, Jean. I don't know if anyone, we still have time, so if any here in the table wants to add something to that conversation about what we can do in terms of education, in terms of our work together. Maybe these people have some more questions. Just, yeah, so are you happy for me to open to other questions? Great. It's, a, it's supposed to be a, an open space, right? So let's do that. Do you want to take the mic? Yes. Thank you. Professor Marcia, Jean, Vito Kiris. So I have a question. I think Jean mentioned a little bit also um, how the lack of formal education. I think just as so the Eliane Brun, they also mentioned a lot how much lots of Brazilians are. Um, uh, are deprived of their citizenship because of the lack of education. Yet, I come from a state in Brazil called Santa Catarina that has a lot of people with formal education, and yet lot, lots of them are fascist, like voting for fascist uh, government at the moment. But I was uh, born and raised there, and I saw, I, so what I feel is that it's maybe an ethics, a problem of ethics, because I saw the people change it over the years, maybe it's just an impression, so I would like to hear your opinion. Because, so, I mean, we can also discuss the role of the formal education in um, 
farming people, but basically seems to me that the notion of what is good, it has changed to people somehow. So does that make sense? So how? So now we have elections coming up, and we know that in the 20th century fascism ends up um, with a lot of suffering. So how do we talk to people again? How can we dialogue and talk to people that we can have a common ground? We don't have to agree on anything, but just have a common ground of what is good and what is good for the humanity and the world moving forward before it's too late. So I guess this is the question. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I don't know, uh, Marcel, if you want to address that because of, of the notion of dialogue as well, which is... Yeah, yeah, we have a little bit of time. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, Eu, uh, I, I think uh, we needed to construct, to build a uh, um, dialogue culture. We need this dialogue culture and uh, of course, education, philosophy, humanities, uh, arts, political, economics, to, uh, all the, of these um, areas could, uh, could, uh, uh, could make this, could do this. <laughs> and then, um, but I think in this dialogue as a, a movement, an uh, international movement, <coughs> and maybe a, a, like a like a party, like a, a movement as MST. <laughs> uh, but I think the great movement of our our time, a uh, great movement around a uh, very hard dialogue, and because dialogue is not a consens consens, uh, is a is a fight. Is there is anything? To, uh, something uh, with attention, inherent attention. And then I, I think the great movement of our time is the feminism. <laughs> feminism is the great movement. And I think uh, um, uh, if we can uh, construct, uh, create, uh, or uh, if we can progress to uh, eco-social feminism, we will have we will have life, we will have future. Uh, uh, because the, cap uh, the capitalism and the patriarchy are the same. We can, we can speak about uh, patriarch capitalism because it's the same thing. And then uh, uh, I think we need to combat, to, to, to fight against this, this, uh, this monster, <laughs> the system. The system that is a system of uh, uh, of uh, this destruction of the world and uh, it's male um, women uh, ch children uh, nature uh, of uh, se uh, sensibility uh, uh, care uh, all of this universe that is of the feminine uh, issue we can say. Uh, is is our our possibility to survive in this in this uh, planet, but uh, in a uh, uh, without or uh, out of this eurocentric geo, geocentric and uh, specific specific uh, uh, form of life. I think we need to become indigenous. And uh, in Portuguese, I say all the time, we need to desemburguesar. Mm -hmm. How can I say this? <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Marcia. I know that we ha might have more questions to come because this is such an amazing panel. <laughs> but I'm conscious of time. And I know there were some questions on Zoom that were actually answered now. And uh, just to let people on Zoom know that the questions that were not addressed, we are going to um, address them um, soon as well uh, by other uh, means. Uh, and I want to thank everyone for, for joining us, everyone on Zoom as well. But most importantly, I want to thank the panel who are very generous with their, with their contributions, their ideas, and, and, their, and their 
movement of hope and action with, with us today. I think we need that. I think we need that kind of sharing. We need that kind of these kinds of spaces where we feel like we can come together and not just um, talk theoretically, but also think about ways of coming together and building something for us. So thank you very much, Marcel. Thank you very much, Victor. Thank you very much, Jean, for your amazing generosity and sharing that. We know that those topics are very, very complicated topics, very difficult topics. Uh, thank you, Jean. Everyone is saying is 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 high-fiving you as well as a way of thanking your, your participation. And to everyone here, thank you so much for being so so positive and so generous. We know that these are very difficult conversations to be had, but we need those spaces where we can come together and talk. And I suppose that this can be a starting point for a lot of us thinking about the roles that we might have in our work. So thank you, everyone. I just want to open the floor very briefly for a message from Anna uh, from Coops. Anna, where are you? Can I see you? There is, some, there is something on my agenda that is called surprise at the end of the event. Is it, so is it wine? I'm not sure. I don't know. It's a surprise for me. So I'm just going to open that to Anna and she might be able to explain what that surprise might be. Yeah, okay, Alex, let's start. So um, what we uh, would like today is as Brazilian society, we are very uh, honor to some Brazilian scholars and people come to this, this city also to, to share our knowledge, our culture and our uh, understand about the world. So I would like to, to invite people from Kuz, from the Brazilian Society, Tamara, Beatriz, Diago, and Beatriz, uh, Ana Maria is going to talk about a award that we start today like uh, honor those people who are come to our city <coughs> because it's our city now. And Anna is going to talk about this idea and why is the name of this uh, special prize uh, our hour. Again, so basically, uh, oops, we introduced this award called the Sabia Award. Uh, the name Sabia. Sabia is a songbird and also the national bird of Brazil. It also a reminder that our wildlife and natural world in general is under threat as their habitats are being destroyed. Sabia is also a song composed by Tom Ruby and Chico Guard in 68 and is about exile during dark times in Brazil's history and how one in exile misses their home country and hopes for brighter days, hoping to come back. Uh, Marcia, Jean, and some others are currently in self-exile as Brazil is once again experiencing dark times in the last years that gained force since the removal of President Dilma Rousseff and the following elections. We, Brazilians in Cambridge, were not in exile, we are just students, but we share some feelings of exile as we are far from our loved ones, which was worse during the pandemic, and concern about the future of our country um, in different ways. We are doing our part in hope to see our country flourish again and leave, leaving behind those dark times, these tempos tenebrosos. This award, the Sabia Award, is a homage to you, Marcia, <laughs> who has been fighting for a better Brazil. I'm sorry, I got emotional. <laughs> and that we hope to, to find when we return. Obrigada. <laughs> Obrigada. <laughs> 
Thank you, everyone, once again for coming. Thank you, Marcia. Thank you, Victor and John. Uh, thank you, wherever you are. And thanks uh, for to the tech team to stay behind. I'm sure there's 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 some kind of celebration happening somewhere. So you are, of course, more than welcome to come. And thank you again. Have a good night. Stay safe. Thanks, everyone.